to support this channel and continuing to provide quality and accessible music education programming, please consider donating to the links in the description or in the pinned comment. Thank you. No, I, I, had, I had influences. I mean, I had people that I could look at in my own home. My mother. There are instances where some singers come out and they technically have it all together. But in most cases, great technique results from having great teachers. In the case of Whitney Houston, she had Emily Drinkard, or as we know her, Sissy Houston. Born in 1933, Sissy Houston got her musical start and training in the church. Presumably, she would have begun singing in the late 1930s to early 1940s. The time frame in which Sissy learns to sing is important. She inherits all of the sounds she hears and then passes them down to Whitney. The 1940s are the start of what's considered the golden age of gospel. Gospel singers are leaving the church circuit to have national and international touring and recording careers. Many people don't talk about it, but at its root, there's a lot of overlap between traditional gospel and operatic singing techniques. to traditional gospel, they often comment that many sound similar to classical singers, and it's because they are doing similar things. How they position their lips. they keep their jaws dropped. The way they stand. And most importantly, keeping the throat open throughout the entire range is why this gospel soprano high C This operatic soprano high C sound so similar. Long and wintry nights. All of these technical things we can see and hear with Sissy Houston. Sissy sings with her jaw dropped. keeps her lips forward and she kept the throat open in all registers throughout her entire range. You can tell her throat is open by looking at the space in her mouth. That open throat singing is what allows her to make those registration switches that Whitney will become known for. Because she sings so open and so relaxed, her tongue vibrates. Sissy is not a big voice, but her voice bounces off the walls and she can be heard without a microphone because she sings so open. Sissy Houston earned a reputation as one of the industry's top vocal arrangers and producers. 
working with everyone from Aretha Franklin and Chaka Khan to Elvis Presley and the Rolling Stone. She would even try her hand at a solo career that wouldn't go anywhere. But interestingly enough, a common trait between Sis Houston and the teachers of some of the most famous voices in classical music, such as Orange Page Kimball and Marinka Gurich, is that these women were excellent vocal technicians whose solo careers never took off. To be able to sing well and to teach someone to sing well are two completely different skill sets, and rarely does someone possess both. Like Gerwich and like Paige Kimball, Sissy was a better teacher and would become known for building voices through her gospel work. Gerwich would give us Martina Arroyo, Florence Paige Kimball would give us Leontine Price, and Sissy Houston would give us. Here's Whitney Houston. The general public first meets Whitney Houston in 1983 on The Merv Griffin Show, and her song of choice is Home from the Broadway musical The Wiz. In the production, Home is sung by the lead, Dorothy. According to the show's musical score, Dorothy's part is explicitly written for an alto with a strong belt. This is important because like many of her contemporaries, Whitney got her musical start and training by singing in church. Per her mother and her best friend Robin Crawford, Whitney's vocal part in the gospel choir was alto and she would sing soprano as needed. In choral music, the structure is generally soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Alto represents the second highest voice in choral settings and the music sings the middle or central harmony. And the power notes for the alto voice and gospel choir generally lie between A in the fourth octave and D in the fifth octave. has an overall vocal range of G to G, with a central singing range of low G to C in the fifth octave. Selecting home as the song to present her to the public shows that she knows her strength lies in the center of her voice, or the chest voice. Even in her earliest teenage recordings, one thing is clear, Whitney has chest voice and a lot of it. And we hear this in her performance of Home. She is not afraid of the low G's in the verses. She is at home singing long lines of C in the center of the voice. Like her mother, she sings with a flat tongue, 
which only means one thing. Like her mother, she sings with an open throat. And we can hear this two ways. When she opens up and the center of her voice is almost as if she's too loud for the microphone. And we can also hear the voice lingering in the hall after she hits a note. It's real. It's a real Our next guest tonight is a talented singer who is recently been getting an awful lot of attention. This is her first album right here, and it's already doing very, very, very well, singing Saving All My Love For You. Please welcome Whitney Houston. In February of 1985, Houston released her debut album. Generally, with young singers, it takes them a couple of albums for them to find their own distinctive musical and vocal identity. And Whitney was no different. By 1985, Sissy Houston had released nine albums. Nine albums that did not sell in any market. Had any of those albums taken off? Had Sissy made it as a solo artist? Listeners and critics alike could have pinpointed just how much Whitney sings like her mother. When I first saw you. Sissy taught Whitney technique and interpretation. Said, oh. Listening to Whitney in these early years, you can hear that Whitney does the same things as her mother, but in a lower voice. How do we know Whitney has a lower voice than her mother? We'll take our tired bodies home and look around and know it's me and you, you and me, me and you. During these early years, they sang together a lot. Watching any of their available performances, you'll see comments such as this, which mentions how much chest voice Whitney has compared to her mother. On the spectrum of voices, from highest to lowest, the lower a voice gets, the more chest voice it has. The more chest voice a voice has, the bigger it is. And the bigger it is, the easier it is to project. Another way to gauge the size of a voice is by how long the voice lingers in the hall after singing. The bigger the voice, the longer the sound will stay in the ear. And you against the world. In this performance of Me and You Against the World, when Sissy sings that God is on our side, you can hear some echo in the hall. That God is on our side. But when Whitney comes in with, And one of us is left alone. And one of us is left alone. The sound is noticeably larger, and you hear that the note she sings on one of us Alone. is still in the air as she begins to sing the next words. Just think of all the days of me and you. When they sing in harmony, Whitney is naturally louder between the two because she has more chest voice. And though we seldom get our due, but when each day is through, we'll take our time. Into comparative comments such as this, Sissy comes across as a lighter sound or more heady sound. It's because she has less chest voice because she has a higher voice. Whitney comes across as a heavier sound or chest dominant because she has a lower voice than her mother. Generally, when other female singers train female singers, 
The teacher teaches the student to sound just like them. And we can hear this in Tomorrow. Whitney does a near carbon copy of her mother's run in this song. Singing like the teacher can also present itself as the student imitating sounds that they hear their teacher make on the same pitches. In the same conversation where one mentions Sissy is more heady, Whitney is more chest dominant, one also says that Whitney's tone comes across as brighter and girly. These are two competing logics, and I will tell you why. Bright and girly generally describe high, small, and very light voices. No one has ever described the Whitney Houston sound as small. Despite these contradictory statements, they strengthen the argument that Whitney has a lower, heavier, and bigger voice than her mother. Because a bigger voice gets brighter and lighter by the singer lightening the sound. If you listen to Sissy singing verses of Alfie, Comparison to Whitney singing the verses of Saving All My Love For You, you'll notice they are making similar sounds around the same pitches. Whitney does this by lightening her voice to match the lighter voice and sounds that her mother makes in this same region. But when she gets to the chorus of Saving All My Love For You, we hear every bit of that vocal weight and power that her mother does not have. But no other man's gonna do The contrast in textures, colors, and sounds makes the Whitney Houston sound instantly identifiable. Perhaps Whitney's most known use of contrast is her quick registration switches from the chest to the head voice. Two muscles control the voice. The TA muscle, which controls the chest voice and low notes. And the CT muscle, which controls high notes. Whitney is considered a power singer, and we compare how she uses her head voice to other power singers, it's no wonder why she stood out. A head voice generally lives on the OO and E sound. Some place where all men are free. Let's compare Whitney singing OO vowels to one of her influences. Shaka Khan. And also her contemporary Jennifer Holiday. If you notice, Khan and Holiday's woo owl sounds sound almost like a chest voice. And it's because they keep the TA muscle or the chest voice engaged as they go up to keep that sound big and dark. Oh, 
Whitney could do this. But she preferred to sing her head voice like this. With a dominant CT muscle sound. That's how we get the brightness in the sound and most importantly, the contrast between the two registers. How all of these women sang their head voice is healthy and it shows that their instruments are all coordinated and connected. It is purely a matter of preference. However, little things like this are what separate Whitney from other power singers, past, present, and future. Houston singing doesn't yet have a signature as distinctive as any of her role models. She lacks Aretha Franklin's jazzy sass, Gladys Knight's embracing warmth, Tina Turner's raw energy, Diana Ross's kittenish sleekness, Denise Williams' delicacy, and the endless dramatic reserves of Patti LaBelle and Jennifer Holliday. Rather, she is a composite of all of these singers, a refined belter who wields power by rationing out her enormous resources carefully. <laughs> People rarely discuss how Whitney Houston and the Whitney Houston album redefined what it meant to be a power singer. Before Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Patti LaBelle, Shaka Khan, and Tina Turner set the standard of power singing. While these women are legends, they will often come under criticism for their heavy-handed approach to soul. the opposite end, you have singers like Dionne Warwick and Diana Ross, who were criticized for choosing phrasing and lyric sensitivity in favor of showcases of vocal power and acrobatics. When Whitney debuts, she shows that a powerful singer could be sensitive, but that a sensitive singer could still be powerful. And this was all solidified by the tone of her voice. Much of the praise around Whitney's earliest recordings is about the purity and the clarity of her tone. There is a grit and roughness in the vocal quality of traditional gospel and R&B singers that was not present in Whitney's voice. To be able to sing these styles of music with a tonal beauty is what truly set her apart from many. And as she progresses in her career and in her development, we will see that it is her tone that critics and fans define her ability by. Besides redefining the sound of the power singer, Whitney redefined the look of the power singer. Before Whitney Houston, big singing was associated with big bodies. And before many saw her on television, music listeners thought Whitney Houston herself was a big woman. So the question was, how was all of that volume coming out of such a small woman? The answer is simple, her head. Keeps that voice. So this is voice technical talk. 
right in alignment, right in what we call the squealo, right in that whole nasal resonating cavity. So all these like your forehead and your cheekbones and your nose and all those things are great resonators. And, and, and in order for a voice to carry it, in order for a voice to be, um, to be healthy, you want to have that sound like right in what we call the mask. The study of head shape and facial features is known as physiognomy. The head, facial features, and body all act as resonators for the voice. Whitney has a diamond-shaped head. The size of her forehead and her prominent cheekbones gave her a lot of space to put a lot of voice. How to shape is basically see someone's diaphragm and to make the resonance in your head instead of in your throat and on your cords. Where did he attempt to place the voice? Right forward, right forward, as you hear it. But would you point? Oh, what I call it what I call it in the front of the face, in the mask of the face. Specifically, would you point to to, to the here? Uh, Miss Bumbry is pointing to the eyes, the cheeks, All in the front and of the face. I think when I when I emit a sound, I think as far forward as I can think. While Whitney is not a classical singer, she has a great understanding of how to use the space to create the sound. And the use of this space is what separates her from her mother. <laughs> Pharyngeal singing is when a singer uses a slightly lower larynx and space from all three parts of the pharynx and the back of the throat and mouth to project the sound. When used properly, it can create a dark and rich quality which gives a booming projection. People often say that Sissy sounds closer to a classical singer than a gospel singer, and that is because she sings with a more pharyngeal focus. It must last till forever. Many people do not like pharyngeal singing in non-classical music, which could be one of the reasons why Sissy's voice rubs many people the wrong way. Singing in the mask is when a singer uses their voice closer to the speaking position. So the space from the nasal pharynx, the top of the pharynx, which sits behind the nose to connect the nasal passages to the throat and lungs is used to project the sound. To clarify, Whitney does not sing through her nose. She sings using the space around her nose. When used properly, singing in the mask can create a bright and pinky quality which gives the voice a more penetrating quality than projected. And bright and penetrating are all qualities that have been used to describe Whitney's voice. And singing in the mask is the preferred sound quality of pop and Broadway musical genre. Whitney Houston. Thank you for choosing me. Outside of changing the realm of singing, the Whitney Houston album changed what it meant to be a successful black woman in music. The record would go on to become the best-selling album of 1986, and Whitney herself was set atop the charts as the number one artist across numerous genres. The album's success would lead Whitney to embark on her international touring career with the Greatest Love World Tour. The tour firmly established Whitney as a performer to watch and showcased her talent not just to reinvent and reimagine her songs, but the songs of others. 
On Someone For Me, she plays with rhythm and time by singing her ad-libs at double the speed of the music and backing vocals. She plays with melody on You Give Good Love by transforming the tune into a reggae flavored number. She uses time to build suspense and tension and I am changing. You can listen to any performance from this tour and see that we don't just have a vocalist on our hands, but an all-around musician. Because the voice is so young, she's about 10 years removed from her adult voice. But we can analyze the touring set list to determine a direction of where she's headed. She opens her show with Michael Jackson's Wanna Be Starting Something. People often don't mention that the speaking and singing voices sit in two different places. When she sings this song, it's almost as if she's speaking the song. And that's why she can float effortlessly into the opening concert dialogue before returning to the song. Wanna Be Starting Something has a little over an octave of range and sits right in the center of her voice. When warming up, you start in the center of your voice and you slowly increase the range on both ends. Eternal Love is another song that sits in the center of her voice, but now she's beginning to stretch out the voice by singing low G's and low A flats. It takes her closer to 20 minutes or three songs to finally be warm enough to start vocalizing above the staff, which she does on You Give Good Love. After the big vocal moment, she cools down with something lighter and less rangy, Hold Me, before going into another rangy song with How Will I Know, before she comes back down again with a Take Good Care of My Heart and nobody loves me like you do. She has two songs to essentially rest before going into another rangy number, saving all my love for you. There's an up and down trend going on here. When Whitney sings a song that takes her to the top of her range, she follows it with a song that keeps her in the center of her voice. That way, she can build the energy to go back up. After saving all my love, Whitney performs Someone For Me, which is very similar to Wanna Be Starting Something. The song sits right in the center of her voice and doesn't require her to do too much work. Keeping the center of the voice warm and flexible is critical in having the strength to do runs and reach the ends of one's range. Someone For Me is followed up with the show-stopping I Am Changing. Choosing I'm Changing as the centerpiece of her live stage show shows that she knows where her strength lies as a vocalist. Look at me. Look at me. The song originates from the Broadway musical Dream Girls and was custom fitted for the original Dream Girl, Jennifer Holliday's voice. While And I Am Telling You is the most popular song from the show, many consider I Am Changing the more difficult piece to sing because of the long lines of singing at full volume in the center of the voice.
The written range for I Am Changing is middle C to high F, with a tessitura of middle C to C. This is a similar tessitura to Home, the last Broadway number we heard Whitney sing. Whitney sings both songs in their original written keys, so it's safe to say that Whitney feels her power note seems to be around C in the fifth octave. We previously highlighted that the set list was arranged in up and down formation. Throughout the night, Whitney has been saving herself for this moment. She reworks I Am Changing into an all-out vocal display of power and range. She goes to the top of her belting ring, to the top of her head voice. She plays with dynamics. She plays with rhythm and timing. She does some of the most intricate vocals we have on record. But what makes this more impressive is that she's doing all of this on someone else's soul. You can likely find everything you need to know about what Whitney was capable of as a vocalist and her rendition of I Am Changing. After the workout of I Am Changing, Whitney cools down by singing and staying in the center of her voice for the rest of the evening. Her range for the night covers low G to high D flat. The tessitura, or where she does the most of her singing, is low G to high F. And her power note seems to be around C or D in the fifth octave in the center of the voice. One of the first write-ups about Whitney's voice type actually occurred in the Pittsburgh Press in the summer of 1985, where they wrote, her cruising range is more alto than soprano, but when she wants, she can turn up the juice and rocket her voice high. Based on her position in choir, the music of others she chooses to sing, how she structures her own set list, it can be concluded that at this point in development, we can see that it's a voice that has range, but it is most comfortable and sounds its best in the middle registers. When it comes to Whitney's voice type, one thing is for sure, this is not a contralto voice. While she has low notes, it's not an area that she stays in a lot. Whitney's voice seems to get tired or reach a wall around high C or high D flat. This would mean one or two things. We have a middle to heavyweight soprano on our hands whose top notes will get better over time, or we have a well-developed mezzo-soprano with a high C. Whitney album continued Houston's meteoric and historic rise to the top. The first album established her as a musician, and the second as a brand. She is on the cover of every magazine, billboard, and TV screen in America and across the world. Many fans and critics consider her first two albums to be peak Whitney. And this can primarily be attributed to the fact that these are the only two albums where we get the same voice on the recording. And that's because the album was recorded while she was touring and promoting the first album. Talk about the transitions in women between 18 and 21. 24, 26, or 27 is 27 and 28 is a big year. 
because then you go through your next transition between that up until 32. A woman's brain and body aren't fully developed until she's in her late 20s or early 30s. The majority of the 20s are a continuation of cognitive and physical growth. It's a time for muscle building and fat accumulation in specific body parts. Comparing Whitney during this time period to her debut years, you will see she has more fat and muscle around her hips, her shoulders, and her breasts. That means her body is still developing, maturing, and getting stronger. A stronger body means stronger, more mature sounds, or as music critics called it, a firmer sound. Speaking of these early years, we mentioned that C or D in the center of the voice seems to be Whitney's power note. Seven singles were released during the Whitney era, and four of the seven singles are centered around her having a power note of C or D. The similarities in her voice and music are even more apparent when she takes the new album on tour. To go to the first tour, Whitney's singing range covers low G to high D flat. On this tour, Whitney's voice is noticeably bigger, but it is still centered in the same place as the debut years, as seen by the tessitura or the primary singing range staying between low G and high F. The most significant difference between this tour and the last is the dramatic decrease in high notes. End of the Whitney era, Whitney is 26 years old. She is still a few more years removed from her adult voice. But if this tour indicates where the voice is headed, there is still a chance she could be a heavier soprano voice. Sopranos such as her cousin Leontine Price Renee Fleming and Shirley Verrett have all talked about how the consistency of the top of the voice between high A and D flat was one of the last things to come in. When you have a big, heavy voice that will only get bigger and heavier, it will get harder to take all of that weight to the top of the range. But on the opposite, this could still be a young, developing, heavy mezzo-soprano voice. And while a mezzo-soprano voice will have the same top note as a soprano, it will not have as many of them to use throughout an entire night of singing. The decrease in high notes could also be due to the tour itself. The number of dates she's performing on this tour has tripled compared to the first tour. Her workload has increased significantly. She's doing more shows and the show length is also longer. Even if she isn't doing as many high notes, she's showing she can still impress the audience in other ways, such as with her great breath control. Greatest Love of All and Where Do Broken Hearts Go got complete rearrangements for live performance. With the standouts being the long sustained 20 second plus notes at the end. The breath is the basis of all singing and sounds. When a singer takes a breath, they can release all the air at once to produce a big sound. Or control the air by releasing it slowly to sing long phrases. And where do broken hearts go? Whitney actually does both. 
she inhales and begins the note quietly. The longer she holds it, the more air she releases and the more volume she generates. She ends the note louder than she started. Controlling the volume with the breath on the same pitch shows excellent technical skill. But on this tour, Whitney is incorporating more gospel into her live shows. In her wonderful counselor arrangement, she shows she has the ear to be a choir director, like her mother Sissy and her cousin Dion. This is how Dion directed her choir. During this call and response moment, Whitney did the same thing. They are playing with rhythm and time by speeding up how many times they repeat a phrase. And this is before we even talk about what Whitney is doing with other people's material, such as Anita Baker and Luther Vandross. The bottom line is that Whitney more than makes up for what the moment of truth tour lacks in high notes and sheer artistry, creativity, and versatility. Voilà, superbe cadeau pour vous. Ces disques de platine et disques d'or, plus la montre tout or, décidément, ce soir, vous êtes couverte d'or. Voici une amie de Sacré Soirée qui est venue plusieurs fois. On paper, the Whitney album was a success, but behind the scenes, it would mark the beginning of significant personal and professional changes. The Whitney album would be the first to bear the name Nippy Inc. Her production company headed by her parents, John and Sissy Houston. The company would also employ friends and family of hers, but also Bobby Brown. There's a saying that goes, the reasons people love you will be the same reasons people hate you. When Whitney debuted, her initial success was with black audiences and on the black music charts. It took a while for that first album to cross over and become a hit with white audiences and in pop music markets. Once the record crossed over, she received a unanimous praise. Oddly enough, the Whitney album is considered one of her best to date. But when it was released, white and black audiences did not have positive opinions about it. White critics called the music monotonous and formulaic. And unlike the first album, Whitney became an instant hit in white markets. So black audiences criticized her for making music for white people. Because I was raised in singing gospel, um, it is actually the basis, the chord changes and the chords in gospel music is actually the music of all music. When I started singing pop music, I found that this is nothing but singing gospel. It's like being back at home, you know? I think that any music, um, well, any music I sing, it's like singing gospel because it comes from the heart, it's from the soul. Whitney often mentioned that the pop music she sang did not differ from the gospel music she sang because she was rearranging this white music to be more gospel. One of the earliest examples of this is on her rendition of Do You Hear What I Hear. 
Bing Crosby popularized the tune in 1963. Crosby's rendition is composed at 101 beats per minute. When Whitney covered the song in 1987, she slowed it down to 73 beats per minute. The change in tempo gave her space to improvise ad-libs and runs, both of which are hallmarks of gospel singing. The way the backgrounds join in when a call and response fashion at the end of a verse is straight from the church. that the backgrounds do, that's gospel. And it doesn't get any more gospel than the girls wobbling that vibrato in the background. Do you know what I know? That heavy, wide vibrato is black gospel music personified. After the first album, and during the run of the second, we see the debut of what music critics call Whitney Clone. These were women who were expected to perform commercially just as well as Whitney because they were just as talented. But they were not just as supported by their labels as Whitney was by hers. They would go, Whitney Houston, Whitney Houston, Whitney Houston. I would go, Mickey Howard, Mickey Howard, Mickey Howard. They wanted a Whitney Houston, but they didn't want to spend the money to make a Whitney Houston. So their talents were often limited to small venues and the R&B charts. And due to their limited success, they inadvertently developed bad feelings towards Whitney Houston herself. And that is where the saying, Whitney Messed It Up For Me comes from. The nominees for Best Music Video are Whitney Houston, I Wanna Dance With Somebody. All of these things will culminate in her getting booed at the Soul Train Music Awards, the premier black award show. So what was Whitney's response to this? The I'm Your Baby Tonight era represents a noticeable shift in how Whitney presented herself, not just as a singer, but as a woman. When she debuted, she is packaged like your traditional diva, stunning gowns and big hair. I mean, look at this wig. This is a 25 year old woman dressed like she's 40. But when you really look at the early years, you'll notice she spoke differently. No, I, I didn't. I wanted to be a teacher, you know, or veterinarian. But uh, when I opened my mouth, I said, whoa, wait a minute, why not? Something you'll notice about the original divas from the 60s and 70s, who Whitney is often compared to, is that they spoke very softly. Taking my time and working with the song, different things like that. And uh, after traveling with him, I, uh, I gained a lot of experience. Gospel taught me um, to know what I was singing about and to be able to feel everything that you're singing. And my mother always told me, 
You can't sing anything that you don't feel. They did this to seem more ladylike and likable to the general public. All of these things change after the release of I'm Your Baby Tonight. Instead of gown, she starts wearing bodysuits and overalls, all things directly associated with black culture and fashion at the time. Last week we had Mariah Carey here in the studio. You did? How is she doing? Her speech is also different. She isn't speaking as softly anymore. It uh, helps a lot, you know, in knowing what you can do and what you can't do. And Cookie. Sometimes. Always? Not always, no. Sometimes. That means sometimes. But more directly, and it's more direct in telling you how she feels. What I'm curious about, what do you think of her? What do I think of her? Yes. I don't think of her. We're back with Video Soul. I'm Donnie Simpson, and we've got another hour to go with the one and only Whitney Houston. Ooh. And I'm delighted to have Compared to the earlier albums, Whitney is appearing on platforms that are explicitly catered to black audiences, such as BT and Arsenio. She's showing you that she is a young black woman. And this is reflected in the media write-ups about her at the time. Publications such as Jet are now saying Whitney has size and soul, words commonly used to describe black women. But how does all of this translate into the music? I'm Your Baby Tonight was considered a straight-ahead R&B album. And compared to its predecessors, it has the smallest demonstration of vocal range thus far. The R&B of the time period was not about rangy singing, but about the groove of the music. And that's why in a 1991 interview with Jet Magazine, Whitney says the most significant difference between this tour and previous tours is that she is now dancing. The I'm Your Baby Tonight tour ran for 90 dates, with a show length nearing two hours like its predecessor. This show is harder than the previous tour because she has to dance. Listening to her sing something like, My Name Is Not Susan, you'll see she often runs out of breath trying to sing and dance at the same time. Another important thing to note is that it is on the I'm Your Baby Tonight tour that Whitney runs into her first voice issues. During rehearsals for the tour, Whitney is diagnosed with a torn vocal cord and is told not to see. She cancels a string of shows, but ultimately, she finishes the tour. Many of the available tour dates online, such as London and Spain, are sung with a torn vocal cord. The set list for this tour continues the up and down arrangement as we see with previous tours. Like the Moment of Truth tour, she's still conservative about how often she sings above the staff. Considering that she's still in good voice and there haven't been any major key changes from songs from the new album, it can be concluded that the longer Whitney Houston has to sing, the less high note she has to give. Adjusting her singing has allowed her voice to continue to grow and develop. She demonstrates more range per night on the I'm Your Baby Tonight tour than she does on the previous two tours. The voice will get bigger and stronger and rangier when you don't push it for range or power. There are two ways to tell that Whitney's voice has gotten bigger. The first is when you compare her singing her power note, D flat, in the 80s. To 
into the 90s. The second and most obvious way we know the voice has gotten larger is in how she begins to maneuver the top of her vocal range. Until this tour, Whitney sang a song called He I Believe. The piece originates from gospel singer Marion Williams. Sissy Houston recorded her version in 1970, and Whitney would sing her mother's arrangement on tour. The climax of the song has sustained lines of high E. On the first tour, Whitney would sing them. On the second, with a bigger voice, she would sometimes sing it. replace it with ad libs. When we last heard the song in live performance in 1990, she removed the lines of high E altogether. In singing, there is a term called passaggio. It is an Italian word that means passage. So it is a passage from one register to the next. Um, so there, are, so actually there, there are a couple of passages. There is where you switch from your chest voice. Uh, uh, you see, it just, it just switched right there. So we have that lower passaggio changes around an E. And then it's the one that I was talking in the middle of the staff, like a B to C sharp. Whitney's favorite note seems to be around C to D in the fifth octave. So it's safe to say she feels a transition down there. Where do you find that the average mezzo tends to feel the passaggi. Oh, okay, so um, I would say between starting at uh, D D five, so an octave and a step above. A common critique about Whitney's vocal range is that her voice will become inconsistent around E flat or E at the top of the stop. But normally, a soprano's is about a major second higher than those things that I just said. So that would be about E at the top of the stop. Yeah. And so that right. means a soprano would be like F sharp G. Right. Around E, a mezzo soprano is becoming aware that she is singing high. Outside of E, I believe, Whitney has another song with written lines of high E. Hold up the light. important part of this phrase is and you'll notice two things when she sings this the E's are fine but on the F sharp she either rasps or she will crack coming down Both of these are signs of the top of the voice being pushed too far. If you want to hear this in a similar voice, Taylor Dane's I'll Wait has a similar vocal line that covers high E to G. In 
live performance, the E's are five. But when she goes up for that G, similar to Whitney, she cracks coming down. That's why she rarely sings that note in live performance. And something you'll notice about Whitney is that she likes to transition to her head voice around E or F. established that Whitney has a big voice, which has grown and will continue to grow. Like taking a weight up a hill, the higher you take it, the harder it will become. During the I'm Your Baby Tonight years, you'll notice that while Whitney can still belt E's, F's, and G's in full voice, He's doing it now with much less frequency than the earlier years, and she is now leaning into her head voice to sing these same notes. Fans and critics alike have likened the quality of Whitney's head voice to that of an opera singer. Outside of Whitney, jazz singer Sarah Vaughan is one of the few contemporary singers who this has also been said about. When speaking of that register's operatic quality, you have to talk about how clear Whitney's vowels are. Vowels are important to the voice. Good, clear vowels are essential to a voice's clarity. Vowels with open space in the throat are how the voice projects. Here, Whitney is holding on to the I vowel in the word give. she is holding on to a clear O vowel sound in the word joy. Her clear vowels are why her rendition of the national anthem is considered the best. The clear E vowel sound on the word free is the most remembered and most replayed part in her rendition. Many singers modify vowels to get to the top of their range, but not Whitney. Whitney sings her vowels true to the text. You never have to question what word or what vowel she sings. When operatic soprano sings the same word free, she changes it to fra. But Whitney sings free. This has been called the Whitney note. And people's inability to sing this note as is written is why many renditions pale in comparison. Her anthem performance is considered one of the greatest moments in music and American history. But as has become customary by that time, critics undermined her success by saying she was lip syncing. But we can put that rumor to rest right now. Earlier, we talked about how the tongue will vibrate when someone is singing relaxed and with an open throat. We saw this with Sissy Houston, and you will see this with many opera singers.
If you watch Whitney's tongue on the word rocket, the tongue is vibrating. The tongue will only vibrate if sound is passing through the vocal cords. The body doesn't lie. Whitney was singing live. Outside of the national anthem, I'm Your Baby Tonight was considered a critical and commercial failure because Whitney did not match the sales numbers of her previous albums. But it's important to note that this album is only a failure if you're comparing it to white artists. When Clive Davis started Airs the Records in 1975, his primary goal was to have a black woman who could sell millions of records by singing pop music in a traditional gospel style. Whitney's cousin Dionne Warwick was actually the first to achieve this in the early 1960s. However, when Whitney debuts in the 80s, the music industry and what is considered pop music had changed. By industry standards, pop music has always been defined as white and R&B has been described as black. At this point in Whitney's career, the R&B charts were still being called the black music charts. I'm Your Baby Tonight was intentionally marketed towards black audiences. In America, there will always be fewer black people than white people which means the ceiling for commercial success is lower. For context, Luther Vandross always stayed within two times platinum. The biggest R&B albums of the early 90s, Mary J. Blige's What's the 411, SWV's It's About Time, all went three times platinum. I'm Your Baby Tonight went four times platinum. That is a massive success for an R&B album. But why settle for four times platinum when you can go eight? Why just be a singer when you can be a movie star? The good thing about being down is there's nowhere else to go but up. To support this channel and continuing to provide quality and accessible music education programming, please consider donating to the links in the description or in the pinned comment. Thank you.